Another Dauntless Lady Susan Written by Laura Rollins For Daniel, never underestimate yourself, you are amazing. Also, don't feel you have to read this story, I know kissing books aren't your thing. Chapter 1 Blackmore Hall, August 1804 William took Susan's hand in his own and they began dancing. Despite the summer sun having gone down, the parlour was well lit thanks to dozens of candles, but the breeze playing between the many open windows failed to keep the heat away. As you can see, William said, annoyance heavy in his tone, I'm already quite practised in all the steps. As they turned, their feet made hardly a noise against the rug. I know that, Susan replied. I was here when your tutor taught you. As was I, Fletcher, Susan's brother and only living relative, called out from where he played the pianoforte. If I'd known what was in store for us that particular year, we wouldn't have come for a visit over the summer holiday. If I'd known a short message would have kept you two away, I would have written as soon as I was informed. William clipped back. Not that either of his friends took the threat seriously. If he were being honest, foul mood or not, William didn't believe his threat either. It was only the three of them in the parlour at the moment, Mother having already retired for the night, and William addressed his next complaint to Susan. I don't see why you suddenly think I need another dance lesson now. How long have I known you, Lord Blackmore? Ah, blast, he was in for it now. Susan only called him by his title when she was either extremely put out with him or had a plan in the works. Twelve years, Susan. Whatever she was up to, he wasn't in the mood tonight. Precisely, she continued, undeterred by his scowls and protests. Come to think of it, when was she ever deterred by anything? And never once have I seen you so persistently upset. I'm not upset. But his words came out rather sharp and seemed to belie his own sentiment. Susan quirked an eyebrow. Upset isn't the right word for it, he amended with a grumble. Nearly every one of his acquaintances had taken to calling out his near-constant moodiness of late, as though they alone truly understood the darkness that clung to him. He was bored and disinterested, or else he was restless and dissolute. I have a word for it, Susan said, spinning slowly in a circle until she faced him once more. Do I dare hear it? William asked. You're in love. William tripped over the next step, and a bang of two very wrong chords came from Fletcher at the pianoforte. In love, both men echoed in unison, Fletcher's voice echoing William's distaste for the notion. Susan's smile didn't falter. More accurately, thwarted by love. Fletcher's gaze flew to William. Did you go and fall in love this past season and not tell me? Of course not. Of all the names his blue devilment had been given over the past year, this one was by far the most ridiculous. He shook a finger at Susan, much as he had when she'd been only a little girl, which she wasn't now, but he shook his finger at her all the same. That's nonsense, utter nonsense, and you know it. His gaze moved from her confident smirk to an uncertain-looking Fletcher. Clearly neither sibling was convinced. What rot. Very well, then. William said, folding his arms. He no doubt looked belligerent, but he didn't care. Who is she? It could be any number of ladies, Susan said far too happily, even as she took his arm and pulled him back into the dance. Fletcher began playing once more. You danced ever so much over the season. As did you, he threw back. Seriously now, a man cannot fall in love without his knowledge. And, Fletcher called from the pianoforte, a man cannot fall in love without telling his best mate. He can if he's an idiot, Susan said. William shot her a flat stare. Come now, Susan said with a light laugh. You shouldn't discredit my notion so out of hand. Just think of all we've been through together. It was true. They had known each other for what felt like forever. He spun her about, his hand resting momentarily against the small of her back. While they danced, his mind drifted back to August after August. And if he understood the glint in Susan's eye, which after so many years he often did, she was reliving those summers too.
Blackmore Hall, August 1792. Twelve years ago. William tugged at his cravat as sweat wriggled down his back. Standing atop the front steps beside Mother, the sun beat down on him like an eaten teacher's scowl during exams. He was only ten. He shouldn't be forced into a jacket and cravat just to meet his guest at the door. Finally, the carriage he'd been awaiting rolled up to the house, and William's face nearly burst with a smile. The door was flung open, and Fletcher, his new best friend, leapt out. William raced forward, fully intending to greet his friend with a hard slap on the back, as he'd seen grown men do. But halfway there, he froze. A little girl, with two blonde pigtails, no bonnet, and the roundest face he'd ever seen, carefully stood on the top step of the carriage. A footman hurried forward and lifted her down. William's nose scrunched at the sight. Who was that? Welcome, Lady Susan, Mother said, hurrying forward and taking the little girl's hand. I'm so glad you could come for a visit. Wait, she wasn't staying the entire month, was she? William turned to Fletcher. His friend shrugged. My little sister. Yuck. Mother hadn't said anything about having a girl here during holiday. William ran up to Mother, who was reaching the front door, still hand in hand with Fletcher's sister. How long is she staying? he demanded. Apparently that was the wrong thing to say, because Mother's eyes lit as though he'd started a bonfire. Lord Blackmore, her voice was slow and held no small amount of warning, you will behave around our guest. He'd simply asked a question, though now that his gaze landed once more on the little girl's face, it was clear she hadn't missed the implication that she was unwelcome in his mind. Mary, Mother said, turning toward the maid, would you please show Lord Fletcher to his room and Lady Susan up to the nursery? Right away, my lady. She took hold of Lady Susan's hand and Fletcher followed them into the house. William, Mother said, placing a hand on his shoulder. He knew from her tone that this would be one of those talks. Do you remember how it felt when your father passed? His stomach tightened, and he suddenly couldn't look at her. Yes, Mother. Your friends? He noticed she used the plural term, as though he and Lady Susan were friends as well as he and Fletcher. Lost both their parents not that long ago. It would be good of us to remember that and show a bit of kindness during their time of sorrow. But she isn't my good friend, only Fletcher. Lady Susan hadn't been with them for months on end at school, getting into trouble and avoiding teachers. Be nice, William. Mother's tone turned firm again. She's too young to play with us. She was hardly more than a baby with her puffy cheeks and pigtails. You can still find ways to include her. Mother turned and moved into the house. William followed. Fletcher and Mary were halfway up the stairs. But where was the little girl? Too late, he noticed Lady Susan lurking just inside the door, her foot out and directly in his path. William stumbled over it, only barely catching himself before landing flat on his face. He whirled around and faced her, tugging his nice new jacket back into place. She stuck out her tongue at him, then dashed up the stairs, quickly passing Fletcher and Mary. William, Mother said, warning evident in her tone. His arms went wide as he protested. Did you see what she did? Be nice. This was so unfair. She was going to ruin his and Fletcher's summer holiday. He just knew it. Blackmore Hall. August 1794, ten years ago, Susan felt every bump, every turn of the carriage between home and Blackmore Hall. She'd long since pulled off the bonnet a maid had tied tightly beneath her chin. For the past two years, Lord Blackmore had made life horrid for her entire holiday. Well, this year, she was coming prepared. They arrived, and a footman opened the door. Like the first year she'd come for summer holiday, and again last year, Fletcher bounded from the carriage without giving her another thought. Now nine, Susan wasn't the baby she'd been at seven and climbed down by herself this time without needing to wait for assistance. Fletcher and Lord Blackmore stood, heads together, laughing and acting as though she weren't present at all. Welcome, Lady Susan, Lady Blackmore said. Susan liked Lady Blackmore. She was kind and attentive and quick to remind her obnoxious son not to be a bacon-brained idiot. Not that Lady Blackmore ever used such a term, but Susan understood her all the same. 
There is tea waiting for you in your rooms, Lady Blackmore said, leading the way into the house. She hoped there were some honey cakes as well. Susan took two steps toward the door. A bucket full of water hit her head and cascaded down over her shoulders. Cold and slimy, it slithered its way beneath the collar of her dress, weighing down her curls until they fell across her face, drenching her dress so that it stuck to her stomach and legs. Susan shivered as a frog leapt off her shoulder. She let out a scream. William! Lady Blackmore called. But the boys were both gone, the only proof they'd ever been present the laughter that trailed behind them. Susan scowled in the direction they'd disappeared. Just wait until she unpacked her bags, then they'd be sorry. Blackmore Hall, August 1796, eight years ago. William hugged the wall tighter still. Do you think she'll scream? Of course she'll scream, Fletcher replied, hunched directly behind him. Girls always scream. The Windown girls certainly screamed at church yesterday, Fletcher laughed softly. That was brilliant. William joined in laughing. Shh, Fletcher said at length, or we'll wake her up before the snakes do. William nodded and forced himself to be quiet. He turned his attention back to the door just around the corner. The best thing had happened this summer holiday. Susan had been given the option to stay in a proper bedchamber instead of the nursery. Better still, the room she'd been assigned was easily accessible by window. Perhaps it was a mean trick for a couple of fourteen-year-old boys to play on an eleven-year-old girl. But this was Susan, and the snakes weren't poisonous or anything. More still, it wasn't like she'd never done anything to them. He still checked his boots every morning before slipping his feet inside, and his bedchamber door hadn't shut right since last August. Finally, they heard the sound they'd been waiting for. But it wasn't a scream exactly, not one of wordless terror. No, it was more of a yell, one including their names and a well-worded promise to bring about their early demise. The door flew open and Susan stomped into the corridor. Her hair was black and dripping from the ink they'd poured in it, several rivulets running down her face, which sported a thunderous expression. In her hands, she held, held, the snakes they'd left by her feet. A cold William had never before known, not when facing bullies or even finals at Eton, crept down his chest. He grabbed his friend's arm. Run. Blackmore Hall, August 1800, four years ago. Susan took a polite sip of tea. This is my favourite room in the house, she said, using the tone she'd heard visitors affect the few times they'd come to call on her. Normally it was only the vicar and his wife, but still a young woman had to learn where she could. It is one of mine as well, Lady Blackmore said, sitting on the settee directly beside her. They both took another sip. Susan watched Lady Blackmore out of the corner of her eye, watching the way her wrist bent and where the elegant woman held her elbow. Susan tried to mimic the movements herself. How are things with your new governess? Lady Blackmore asked. I have found her to be all that is lovely and punctual. Thank you for recommending her. Punctual, Lady Blackmore said with a small laugh. Susan felt her smile falter. Had that not been a perfectly suitable choice of words? Punctuality was a trait she'd heard spoken of highly many times. Is that not a good thing? Susan asked slowly. Lady Blackmore gave her a kind smile. Absolutely. A very admirable, good heavens. Susan didn't have to look up to know the sight that was before them, and a giddiness spread through her. She did, however, look up all the same. As expected, there stood William. She'd given up forcing herself to call him Lord Blackmore the previous year, and Fletcher in the parlour doorway, covered head to toe in mud and manure. Susan was somewhat surprised they'd been able to make it this far with so much muck clinging to their faces and boots. Could they even see Lady Blackmore's horrified expression? Or Susan's own calm smile? She certainly hoped so. What on earth have you two been doing? Both boys, now men at eighteen and easily a head and a half taller than Susan, who was only fifteen, 
dove into their story. With them speaking one over the other, it was hard to make out more than something about horseback riding and a branch that had snapped. On second thought, Lady Blackmore said, holding up a hand, I don't care. You will go back outside, clean yourselves off, and then come back in and mop up any muddy footprints you carried in just now. William and Fletcher tried to protest, but Lady Blackmore would brook no argument. As they turned to leave, William glanced over his shoulder at Susan, his brow creasing. The mud which had caked there cracked into angry lines. Susan lifted her teacup in a saucy salute. After William and Fletcher left, Susan and Lady Blackmore continued to sip tea in silence for a few minutes. At length, Lady Blackmore whispered, Well played. Blackmore Hall, August 1802, two years ago. William stood at the front door, hands twitching where he held them behind his back the summer sun beating down on him like it always insisted on doing. Where were they? Normally Fletcher and Susan were here before tea time, and it was nearly dinner already. The roads between their home and his were usually well maintained. He hoped nothing had happened to them. His eyes jumped to the bucket of pond water he had suspended just above the door. It had been a few years since he dumped water on Susan, but this past year at university had been a beast, and he needed a good laugh. He'd always imagined that when he turned twenty, life would fall at his feet. What a fool he'd been. The rattle of carriage wheels reached him, and soon the carriage was pulling up in front of the door and the steps were being lowered. Fletcher exited the carriage first, as he always did, rushing up the steps to slap William on the back. Look up, William whispered during the embrace. Fletcher's eyes caught sight of the bucket at once. I've missed you, my friend. And are you? William agreed. He turned to watch Susan. He doused her with water more times than he could count over the years, yet it never failed to lift his spirits. Susan stepped into the sunlight, and at the sight of her, William's breath caught in his throat. Her once round face was now more heart-shaped. Her figure, too, had changed. Now seventeen, she was no longer a little girl, but clearly a woman. She wore no bonnet, as she had never outgrown her intense dislike of them, and her hair was pulled up, a few curls falling around her face and neck. Her nose was petite, her large eyes framed by dark lashes. She walked up the stairs toward them, a single hand hanging oddly behind her back. Was she carrying something? Susan neared the spot where the pond water was sure to dump. However, just as William noticed the bucket begin to tip, Susan pulled an umbrella out from behind her, popped it open, and angled it above her head. The water hit her umbrella, and thanks to the angle sprayed over himself and Fletcher. William got a mouthful of pond water, and the frog that had been bathing in the bucket moments ago leapt off the umbrella and onto Fletcher's head. Sputtering and suddenly very cold, William ran a hand over his face, only managing to smear the dirty water around more. The frog let out a loud croak. Susan, smiling innocently, took one step closer to them both and shook her umbrella in their direction. Tiny droplets of dirty water hit him in the face and chest. Having shaken it off enough, Susan closed the umbrella and handed it to a footman nearby. So good to see you again, William, she said sweetly, and then stepped inside the house, completely dry. The sight of her smile did something strange in the vicinity of his chest. Still, William laughed it off, even while slapping Fletcher on the shoulder. My friend, I have never been so happy for August to come around. Almax, May 1804, three months ago, Susan stood near an open window allowing the almost non-existent breeze access to the back of her neck. It wasn't much, but at least it was something. Though she was already 19, this was nonetheless her first London season. It had been far more hot and muggy than she'd anticipated, but it had also been far more exciting and delightful than she'd ever dreamed. So many fine gentlemen, so many beautiful ladies. She'd had almost a non-stop stream of gentlemen callers these past many days, and she was giddy with delight. It was moments like this that made her wish the season would never end. William stood near the opposite wall, supposedly speaking with two ladies, 
At least they were clearly trying to engage him in conversation. But he held that same disgruntled look he'd worn since they'd all arrived in London. Susan was beginning to think something was truly the matter. She'd never known William to be so glum all the time. Weren't most men gay and carefree at twenty-two? If he was upset over no woman having set her cap at him, he ought to learn how to stop giving the impression he wasn't interested. Though William had grown into a handsome gentleman, he hadn't ever developed the regal bearing his mother held, or the eloquent refinement that a Marquess truly ought to have. Perhaps she should give him a few pointers. William's gaze met hers. The tension across his face eased a bit, and he slowly shook his head as though to say, Ridiculous, isn't it all? She gave him a purse-lipped stare back. It's your own fault you're not having a good time. Lady Susan? She turned to find Lord Thompson bowing before her. Susan curtsied. Now here was a paragon. Tall, perfectly curled, blonde hair, a nose a Roman god would be jealous of. He was intoxicating, really, if a bit of a fop. Would you care to dance? he asked. Susan didn't have to fake a smile. I would be delighted. She accepted his hand and they moved toward the dance floor. Still, concern for her friend caused her to glance over at William yet again. His gaze had left her and was squarely on Lord Thompson, and his scowl had returned. Blackmore Hall, August 1804, present. William moved begrudgingly through the next steps, though it took all his willpower not to stomp the whole way. Fletcher's performance at the pianoforte was exemplary. Susan moved gracefully beside him, and yet he couldn't find it within himself to enjoy the moment. We have been through much together, haven't we? Susan said, nostalgia heavy in her tone. Including much dancing, he grumbled back. Therefore, I cannot see the point in doing so again. Yes, but what you did earlier this year clearly wasn't working for you. Sometimes he enjoyed Susan's wit and sharp tongue. Other times, like now, it rankled. And what is it you are supposing my dancing wasn't doing for me? Impressing the ladies, of course. This was ridiculous. As he had already stated, he hadn't particularly enjoyed the company of any lady last season. The only moments he could recall that he did enjoy were those mornings with just the three of them, breakfasting together while laughing about the previous night. The few carriage rides through Hyde Park Susan had convinced him to take her on, whispering together at the Windown's musical. Those were the only moments of the season even worth remembering. He turned in time with the music and came to stand shoulder to shoulder with Susan, she slipped her hand up and over his arm, settling it atop his own. Even as they promenaded, a heat spread over his hand where her palm lay. As it was only the three of them, they'd all long since removed their gloves. Her skin, lightly resting atop his, sent sparks up his arm and straight into his heart. She turned and smiled up at him. It was like that day she'd used her umbrella to douse him with pond water while protecting herself. Instead of a cold spray of water, however... It was a heated realisation. Instead of dirt and muck hitting him, it was a pronounced pricking against his skin. All right, so this wasn't at all like being doused with pond water, but it was sudden and equally as unexpected. It was also as all-consuming and undeniable. He had fallen in love. When it had started, he couldn't say. It had probably been that moment she first tried to trip him and stuck her tongue out at him. Regardless, at some point, and without his knowledge or consent, he had fallen for Susan. She looked up at him, listing her head. William, are you all right? William blinked. He was standing in the middle of the floor, looking at her but not moving. When had he stopped dancing? She stood close to him. A hot awareness coursed over his entire frame. He took a large step back. William ran a hand down his face. He needed a reason to leave. And then he needed some time and space to think. I just remembered something, he stammered. Something I need to see to. Always excuses, Susan said, casting her gaze heavenward. If you're headed up, Fletcher said, standing up from the pianoforte, I'll walk with you. I promised Forrester a bruising ride first thing tomorrow. Susan shook her head at her brother. 
If you gave your studies half the attention you did that horse, your exams would have gone far better. William let the conversation continue behind him. He'd made his excuses, and all he could think about now was escaping. Maybe this would make more sense in the stillness of his bedchamber. He was vaguely aware of Fletcher moving to walk beside him, still talking to Susan. Or perhaps sleep was all he needed. Maybe he was simply hallucinating feelings that weren't really there, and this delusion could be credited to exhaustion. Was he going mad? Susan, aren't you coming? At the sound of her name, William began listening to Fletcher again, pausing near the parlour door. On the one hand, he desperately did not want Susan to walk with them up the stairs. He needed space. He needed to get his head back on straight. Yet he also couldn't deny a strong pull. He wanted her beside him, and the want seemed to echo up from somewhere deep inside. The two desires waged battle in his stomach, and it felt as though, in place of soldiers, there were hundreds of angry butterflies all covered in needles. Butterflies covered in needles. Lud, he really was going mad. You two go ahead, Susan said, returning to the settee and once more picking up her needlework. I'm nearly finished and would like to see it done before I retire tonight. She sat down and seemed to immediately forget them as she worked. The candle beside her cast light over the gentle curve of her neck. Why had he not realised before just how breathtaking she was? He'd known she'd grown up, but somehow he hadn't truly seen her. More than that, he hadn't recognised how vital she'd become in his life. A source of joy he needed to know would always be there, to laugh with him, to jest with him, to face each new challenge with optimism and hope together. Susan's needle caught the candlelight, and William ran a hand over his unsettled stomach. He had no idea what to do with the realisation. Sleep well, Fletcher called to his sister, quite as though the world hadn't just been flipped on its head. William couldn't find any words at all, so he silently followed Fletcher from the room. They walked up the stairs, Fletcher softly whistling the jig he'd been playing moments ago. They reached the landing and turned down the corridor. Say, William, Fletcher slowed as they neared both their bedchamber doors. You wouldn't actually go and fall in love without telling me, would you? William froze, then caught himself and forced himself to relax and smile. No, of course not, William said. All the while knowing that he already he had. Chapter 2 Susan chose to sleep in the next morning. She'd been up quite late finishing her needlepoint, a task she'd been sadly neglecting. Moreover, it was only her brother and William at breakfast most mornings, so it wasn't as though she would miss anything. Finally dressed in Pomona green as it was one of her favourite colours, Susan ate in her room and then walked out to roam the garden. Even the mornings were hot now. August could be such a beast. Still, she dutifully tightened the bow of her bonnet beneath her chin. A proper lady of society did not allow her face to develop freckles. She turned left at the fork, her feet carrying her to the usual spot without much thought. There, on the green, stood the tallest tree of all, an elderly beech tree. As children, she, Fletcher and William had often held hands and tried to reach all the way around the tree's massive trunk. They finally succeeded the year both boys shot up into men. Susan placed her gloved hand against the rough trunk. The feel, the smell, the light trickling between leaves. It was as familiar to her as any sight at Blackmoor Hall. She tipped her head back, peering up at the leaves, and they danced in a soft summer breeze. Though she'd played here often as a girl, she'd never once told anyone what most drew her here. This tree, so stately and sure, reminded her of father. She'd been young when he'd passed, barely out of leading strings. Yet, she still held on to a few memories of him. Father carrying her and her feeling as though she was high as the birds. Father speaking to Fletcher, his tone firm and steady. Father sitting in church, his back ramrod straight, his gaze never leaving the vicar. Father speaking to their neighbour, the perfect embodiment of all that was poised and refined. That was the sort of man she would marry some day. Someone stately and poised. Someone like you, she whispered up to the treetop. Why pray tell, are you wearing a bonnet? Fletcher's voice from behind her made Susan whirl around. 
She gave both him and William a forced smile. They hadn't heard her, had they? She would be mortified if they had. Stately and poised gentlemen did not marry ladies who spoke to trees. She was careful to always be on her best behaviour, but it was discouraging that even so many months after her coming out, she still often slipped up and reverted to the silly, childish actions of her youth. Susan placed a hand at the back of her bonnet. I am a lady now, don't forget, she said, as much to herself as the two men, and ladies wear bonnets when they go out. Fletcher's face quirked to the side. But you detest wearing bonnets. He was right. Silk gloves made her feel elegant, and warm ones in the winter were heaven-sent. Dresses of fine fabric made her feel beautiful, and she loved the scent of rose water. But bonnets? She could never find one that didn't flatten her curls or press uncomfortably against her forehead. Inevitably, they covered her ears and made it hard to hear the call of the woodlark or the wind rustling the trees. Susan placed a hand against the old beech tree. Some goals, however, were worth sacrificing for. What are you two about this morning? She asked, purposely changing the subject. Her objective in wearing her bonnet would be wasted on them. Though it was two men she spoke to, neither of them had truly matured past a thirteen-year-old boy, as evidenced by their constant teasing and lack of connection with any lady of style. We thought to go riding, Fletcher said. Again? Susan scoffed, then caught herself and smoothed out her tone. I hope you appreciate what a good friend William is to put up with your insatiable love of horses. If you were a man, you'd understand, Fletcher said, turning back toward the path which would take them to the stables. Come on, Blackmore. William, however, stayed where he stood. Would you care to join us? Susan blinked. Had he truly just said what she thought he'd said? And yet, for all her doubts, he stood there still, waiting for an answer. How many times had Susan dreamed of her brother and his friend asking her to join them on a ride? How many hours had she worked herself to the bone, riding within an inch of her life so she might be good enough to keep up with them? All of that and the invitation came now? No, but I thank you, Susan said. She may have once wished for such a thing, but she'd most certainly moved on now. She had no more need to prove herself to either man, no need to be seen as their equal. She wasn't a child, eagerly trailing after her brother and his friend. She was a lady, and as such, had far more elegant pursuits to occupy her mind and time. Susan bid both men farewell and turned to head back toward the house. There was to be a small country assembly tonight, and Lord Thompson was rumoured to be among the guests. Susan had much to prepare. William watched Susan walk away. She didn't so much as glance back at him. Strange how much that hurt. William shook his head. He was still reeling from last night. Unfortunately, he hadn't slept well as his head had been swirling far too much for rest. So, either he was delirious from lack of sleep, or he truly had fallen for Susan. What a mess. Blackmore, Fletcher's voice jarred William from his thoughts. He was still staring off toward the corner of the garden where Susan had disappeared. He turned and found Fletcher watching him quite impatiently. Are we riding or not? Fletcher asked. Yes, of course. William turned his steps toward the stables and hurried forward. Are you all right? Fletcher fell into step beside him. You've been acting strange all morning. William was still trying to wrap his mind around his new reality. He was far from ready to voice his thoughts to anyone, not even his best friend. I didn't sleep well last night is all. It wasn't a lie, but neither was it the whole truth. Ah, I was wondering why you'd asked Susan to join us. William pulled to a quick halt. What was that? Fletcher shrugged. You were looking for an excuse to keep our ride simple. Too bad for you, old chap, that I am well rested, and nothing will suit me but a bruising ride. Relief drew out from William in a long breath. His secret was safe yet. I should have known you'd see right through me. Fletcher laughed 
and they started walking once more, though this time in silence. William hated to bring Susan's name up once again, but at the same time he couldn't get her off his mind and so he couldn't think of anything else to speak about. That, and he did need to know. Will Susan be joining us for dinner tonight, do you suppose? She used to be a stable presence at every meal, but since her coming out earlier that year, she was more often gone than present. Doubtful, Fletcher said, hurrying faster as they neared the stables. There's the assembly tonight, remember? She'll probably be too busy getting ready, and will take a tray in her room like last time. That's right. The assembly was tonight. He'd completely forgotten. The groom had clearly anticipated their desire for a ride this morning, for he led both horses out of the stable as they neared, already saddled. Fletcher thanked him, and then easily threw himself up and into the saddle. It's a good thing Susan gave you that dancing lesson. His tone was full of jest. Just in time for tonight. William threw his leg over his own horse, all the while his mind snagging on the beginnings of an idea. It was a rather long lesson, wasn't it? Fletcher stroked Forrester's neck. You must have danced horribly all season long. Susan hasn't spent that much time boring us for nearly a year. It was true. He couldn't recall the last time she'd spent that long in his company. The rest of the plan quickly fell into place in his mind. A heated excitement filled his chest. This just might work. William looked up and gave Fletcher a smile. He'd start on it this afternoon. Right after he showed Fletcher what a bruising ride truly was. Chapter 3 According to Susan's Abigail, who William luckily had run into a moment ago, Susan ought to be waiting in the front entrance, dressed and ready to leave for the assembly. She was not there, however, when William descended the staircase and looked about. He placed his hands on his hips. Where had she gotten herself off to now? She didn't seem to be avoiding him per se, but she certainly hadn't made herself available for a tete-a-tete. -tete. This plan was never going to work if he couldn't so much as talk to her alone. The house was completely silent. Mother was still in her room, donning the last few touches of her ensemble he knew. He wasn't sure where Fletcher was, but probably not even in the house, if the silence was any indication. William crossed the entryway but found no one in any of the adjoining rooms. He took the stairs back up. A soft light spilled out from the slightly ajar door leading into the parlour. He pushed it open and peered inside. Susan stood in front of the hearth, her gaze on her own image reflected in the mirror above. A hand rested against her collarbone and the pearl necklace she wore. They'd been her mother's pearls, so he'd been informed once, in no uncertain terms, after teasing her for wearing them many years ago. The elegant necklace had looked out of place when he'd first seen her wear it, her hair down and her cheeks covered in freckles. Now she'd quite grown into it. William moved toward her, his steps nearly silent on the thick rug. You look lovely tonight. It wasn't the first time he'd complimented her, and yet this time felt different to him. This time, he wasn't saying it out of common courtesy, or because Mother was requiring it of him. This time, he wholeheartedly meant it. Susan cocked her head to the side, her gaze not leaving the mirror. While we were in London, Lady Young said I looked more like my mother every year, Yet when I look at her likeness and then my own visage, I can't find the similarities. Ah, she was in that mood. For all Susan's light-hearted joy and optimism, there was an intense introspective streak which ran through her all the same. Susan turned, placing a hand on the mantel and facing him. I don't truly remember what she looked like. Sometimes I imagine we're as similar as twins, and at others... I wonder if it isn't only something our neighbours say in the hopes I'll find happiness in the idea. In that likeness you showed me last year, your mother had curly blonde hair, such as you do. William rested his shoulder against the hearth, facing her. Susan returned to gazing at the mirror. Yes, but just because we have the same hair doesn't mean we look the same. Lots of women have blonde hair. True. Still, William remained silent choosing instead to watch Susan tip her head, first one way and then another, as she tried to catch sight of her mother in her own expression. She stilled after a minute. You know what I do remember? When they died. 
The word hung heavy between them as the candles atop the mantel continued to flicker, their light dancing over both of them. I remember the vicar visiting a few days later and saying that, though my parents were gone, their spirits would stay with me and Fletcher. They would walk beside us as we grew. They would watch over us and guide us. William ached for that little girl who had to dress in black and say goodbye to both beloved parents. Do you believe they have? Her brow dropped. I don't know. The vicar spoke last Sunday on how all good people go to heaven. Somehow I don't see following either me or Fletcher around all these years could be considered heavenly. So I guess I don't know what to think. William took hold of her hand, cradling it in his own. I am sure, wherever they are, with you or in heaven, they are both proud of the young lady you have become. Susan blinked rapidly. I wish I could be sure of the same. And what precisely do you suppose they would find fault with? Susan cast her eyes toward the ceiling. My mother was married by the time she was seventeen. I'm already nineteen and haven't had a single proposal. Hardly anyone gets married that young anymore. Besides, wasn't your parents' union arranged? Her lips pulled to the side. Yes, I suppose that's true. You've only been out for a single season. Lots of women are married after only one season. She turned back to the mirror, her brow still crinkled in harsh assessment. Do you suppose the problem is that I'm not dignified enough? My parents were both very refined. She pulled her hand away from his, stepping back so she could see more of herself in the mirror. William felt the cold air where her hand had been. He missed the touch immediately. Did she? Judging by the way she twisted side to side slightly and smoothed the front of her dress, no, she probably did not. You said I look lovely, but would you consider me elegant? She lifted her chin. Refined, perhaps? She looked like Susan, albeit a Susan trying to be someone she wasn't. But she wanted him to say yes, so what else was he to do? You look dignified enough for the royal court. Her shoulders slumped. Don't tease about this. Huh. Apparently his compliment had fallen far from the mark. Well then, it was time to implement his plan. I wasn't trying to tease, but I suppose it is as you said last night. It clearly didn't work. Her expression changed instantly, the doldrums of before slipping away and a mischievous grin taking their place. Are you saying I was right about the other thing as well? If by the other thing she meant what he thought she meant, Lud, this might get tricky. Susan drew closer to him, placing a hand against his arm. Has some lady caught your eye at last? Perhaps, he said slowly. Her smile brightened. You simply must tell me who. Miss Windone, perhaps, or Lady Elizabeth? Good gads, he was failing far more than he'd realised. No, I can assure you it is neither of them. Susan far too readily listed several other women of their acquaintance. At this rate, if he denied them all, she'd quickly learn it was her or assume he'd fallen for a maid or lady of disrepute. With her eagerness to determine which woman he'd taken a liking to, he strongly suspected it would be the second. William held up a hand. I think it's best if I don't tell you who at this point. Don't be absurd. Of course you can trust me. I promise not to go blabbing about. Let's just say if there were a lady I could see myself sharing a life with. The words were thick and wouldn't come without a fight. How might I go about letting her know? There are many little ways. How you talk to her, how you dance with her, reaching for her hand when it isn't strictly necessary. Small actions such as those. That was an overwhelming list if ever William had heard one. Suppose... His tone turned upward as the sentence he'd been hoping to ask fell from his lips. You give me lessons? Susan's brow dropped again, yet this time it was clearly in confusion and not consternation. Like last night, William hurried on, I know I complained about the dance lesson, but on further reflection I think you were right. Perhaps if we met, one on one from time to time, you might instruct me on how to go about things. And with any luck, some time alone would grant him the situation he needed to show her exactly what he'd come to realise, that they were perfect for one another. They were a hand and a glove, a pot and lid, a candle and wick. 
though none of those comparisons sounded at all romantic or reason enough to marry someone. This was exactly why he needed lessons. He needed them to improve his manner so that he might make an impression on her. And who better to learn how to court from than the very woman a man wished to court? It was a brilliant idea. And yet, he was still nervous enough that he could feel his own hands shaking where they were clasped behind his back. Formal lessons, you mean? Susan asked, her gaze darting about as she contemplated what he'd said. Whatever you think I need. He could only hope she'd say he needed time alone with her. I like the idea, she said at length. William tried to hide his breath of relief, but as quickly as he felt himself relax slightly, he heard Fletcher's heavy tread up the stairs. I think we'd best not tell your brother, he rushed to say. Susan nodded. Agreed. Did she agree because she wanted to be alone with him as much as he did with her? Susan continued, her own gaze jumping toward the parlour door. Clearly she'd heard her brother approaching as well. Fletcher would never keep your secret, and if the lady learns you care for her before she's ready, it could spoil everything. Apparently not. She only cared for his own sake. Sweet though that was, it still was met with the taste of disappointment, but he wasn't going to let the small blow stop him. May we begin tomorrow morning? While Fletcher is out riding, I'll make up an excuse why not to go. Susan nodded. And try to remember what I said last night while you're at the assembly. William nodded in return just as the parlour door opened behind him. Are we ready to go? Fletcher said, striding into the room. In unison, William and Susan put on unaffected smiles. Yes, Susan said. Absolutely, William agreed. And they both left the house, pretending nothing unusual had happened at all. Chapter 4 Lesson number one, Susan said as they strolled through the garden the following morning. Many gentlemen speak to dozens of ladies on any given evening and then freeze up the moment the woman of their affection tries to speak to them. She'd seen it play out most painfully more than once during her London season. It is quite ridiculous. More than anything, a woman wants a man who will speak to her and give her all his attention. So, have you spoken to the lady yet? William walked beside her, his hands behind his back. Yes, on several occasions. Oh, that was a bit of a surprise. Then you are not as hopeless as I thought. Your confidence in me is inspiring. She gave him a flat stare. If you could win the affections of the lady you desire on your own, you wouldn't have asked me for help at all, would you? Fair point. They turned right at the fork, both wordlessly agreeing that they needed to take the longer route about the gardens. What did you two speak of? Susan asked. She had only vague memories of her parents speaking with one another. She knew it had happened often enough, that her little girl self had found nothing strange in listening to them talk about this neighbour or that over tea. She could vaguely recall father's even tones, the calm, steady way he always expressed himself. Perhaps she ought to mention to William that his voice needed to sound sure of himself and refined, not the easy, casual timbre he always used around her. Um, William said at length, drawing Susan's mind back to him. There have been a few different topics brought up between us. For example, Susan pressed. William finally shrugged. I don't know. Just different things. Susan stopped in the path and turned to him, folding her arms. Lesson number two. You must always remember what you've spoken about. William stopped beside her. Is that truly lesson number two, though? I feel lesson number one should encompass all topics regarding conversation. Isn't remember a conversation just more on that same topic? Heaven help the lady William had set his sights on. Very well. Lesson number one and a quarter. Always remember what was said. William gave her a firm nod. Remember what was said. Understood. He started them walking once more. 
For example, I remember that last night you were concerned about looking dignified, but you were very dignified all the evening long. I also remember a few days ago when you declared the dinner to be far superior to anything else you'd ever eaten, barring only the harvest feast your own cook prepares once a year. I also remember, when you first arrived at Blackmoor Hall this year, your smile could have brightened an entire room. When I asked you what was so funny, you simply said, I'm glad to be back. Susan's step slowed. He'd remembered all that. The realisation heated her chest. She'd had no notion he'd been paying such attention. Yes, she said. If you remember your secret lady's words so well as that, you will be well on your way to earning her affections. Thank you, teacher, he said with a cocky smile. One that brought a smile to Susan's face as well, and a less than dignified desire to bring him down a peg or two. Of course, she said, her tone unaffected, If you walk beside her as you are walking beside me now, she will never know you care two straws for her. His face was priceless. Instantly the smile was gone, replaced with a look of confusion. He glanced down at himself, as though searching for the error in his step. What's wrong with the way I walk? As much as she desired to be refined and elegant like her parents, there were moments when being something less was quite worth it. Susan motioned to the space between them. You're all the way on the other side of the path. A gentleman does not crowd a lady. There's so much space here, a horse could pass between us. William stomped his way closer to her, so close, in fact, that he towered over her. With his hands clasped behind his back, they didn't touch. Yet if she so much as leaned in, she'd find herself flush with his chest. Is this what you mean? He asked, one eyebrow raised. He smelled of sandalwood, which was surprising. It was a scent she associated with grown men, tall and handsome. She wouldn't have guessed William, of all people, would smell like that. She supposed she must allow that he would have grown up over the years, as she had, only it was hard to see him as anything other than her brother's friend, the man who she teased and who teased her in return. Susan placed her hands on his chest and shoved him back. His chest was firmer than she expected, another surprise. Another fact she chose to ignore. Do you wish to learn how to do this the right way or not? She asked. Her heart was suddenly racing, however, and she wished it would stop. This was William not Lord Edgerton, or better still, Lord Thompson. William let her adjust his position to the centre of the path. Next, she said, willing her mind and heart to behave themselves. Offer me your arm. He did so willingly and without complaint. Susan slipped her hand around it. Now we may walk. William shook his head, a glint of mischief in his eye. This isn't walking. He motioned to where her hand rested on his arm. This is touching. I think we've moved on to lesson number three and you conveniently forgot to mention it. This is part of walking, Susan protested. Perhaps agreeing to lessons was not so grand an idea as she'd originally believed. Besides, touching will be lesson number ten at the earliest and stop worrying so about the number. These are my lessons and I'll label them any way I choose. Yes, teacher. Susan was agitated and William found an unholy pleasure in it. She wasn't angry. He'd seen her angry several times and he knew this wasn't it. She wasn't upset or frustrated or bored. No, she was agitated. But exactly why, he wasn't sure. Something about their lessons was proving irritating to her. That much he could tell. It had begun yesterday morning, during their first lesson, which had bled into their second lesson. Her words had become clipped, her posture straighter. She was like an old governess, rehearsing facts and expectations by memory. It was a new side to Susan he hadn't seen before, and one he was dying to tease. But if he were being fully honest with himself, he was fairly sure that if he pushed her, he'd only end up with angry Susan. 
after the snakes and ink incident when she had been eleven and he fourteen, well, he wasn't anxious to see that side of her again. Lesson number four, Susan started, sitting in the settee across from him in the parlour. Lesson number three had been covered that morning, how to be a gentleman during breakfast. It included him preparing a plate for her and somehow magically knowing all of her favourite foods. If he'd been aspiring to catch the notice of any lady other than Susan, he would have had to declare himself beat, as he had no idea how a gentleman would happen to know something so personal. But as it was Susan he was interested in, he'd seen her at breakfast plenty of times to know she'd want toast with jam, a very small serving of eggs, and a cup of drinking chocolate. Susan had tried to hide her surprise that he knew what she'd like behind a stern, lucky guess and no smile. That, however, left William biting the inside of his cheek to keep from laughing out loud. A maid slipped into the room, placing the tea service between them. Susan waited until she'd left again before asking, Have you called on your mystery lady during her at home? No, actually, I can't say that I have. Susan paused, her hand halfway to the teapot. Not even once? William shrugged. Why would he have? He far preferred spending time with her when not having to be all stiff and polite due to the presence of company. With a shake of her head, Susan reached for the tea and poured. Truthfully, William, you are an oddity. He took the cup she offered him. Is that how you see me? And did she like oddities? Half these lessons you need no instruction in at all. The other half you are woefully lacking in experience or tact. I will consider myself blessed, then, to have such a patient teacher. He was unable to keep all jesting from his tone, however, and Susan caught on to it. She lifted a single brow, her lips pressing into a tight line as she ever so slowly leaned back in the settee. It was a look meant to warn him. If he took things too lightly, she would be gone before he could blink. She had no qualms over leaving him to his own devices. That he fully knew. After all, the whole point of asking for these lessons was so he could spend time with her. If he learned a thing or two along the way, so much the better. Forgive me, he said, calming his tone. That sounded insincere. That should possibly be a lesson all on its own, never sound insincere when complimenting a lady. How's this? William placed his cup back on the saucer. Thank you, Susan, for spending time with me. Her face fell. We'll have to work on that. Work on it? I thought that was quite well done, he protested. She shook her head. You still sound like you're jesting. If a woman thinks, even for a brief moment, that you are only saying what you think she wants to hear, she'll discount the whole of it. Well then, if she felt he needed practice, then he would practice. William placed both feet firmly on the ground, returned his tea to the table between them and rested his elbows against his knees. Susan, he said, his brow creased in the hopes that his words would prove his sincerity. I enjoy our time together immensely. She pulled her lips to one side. Now you just sound angry. Lud, this was harder than he'd expected. He sat up straighter, running his hands over his knees. Of all the women I've ever known. Oh, for heaven's sake. Don't ever mention other women when you're trying to let a lady know how important she is to you. William ground his teeth, a ball of frustration quickly growing in his chest. There's nothing else I'd rather be doing right now than sitting with you. Is that a question? Susan asked. Because you sound unsure. I don't care if I sound sure. I thought I was trying for sincere. Susan rocked her head back and forth. You certainly sounded sincerely unsure. William let out a loud groan and slumped back in his chair covering his eyes with a hand. No wonder Susan had no notion he liked her. He was bungling this from aft to stern. Perhaps, Susan's voice reached him, softer this time, we ought to put this lesson aside for now. She was taking pity on him, mainly because he was pitiful, and he felt it. He felt small and wholly incapable of doing the single thing that was most important, letting Susan know how he truly felt about her. But right now, he didn't care if she was fully aware of his pitiful nature. He just needed to be done for a bit. Thank you, he breathed out. Susan laughed lightly. He sighed and ran a hand over his eyes. What's so funny now? She was fighting a smile and he had no doubt he was the brunt of the joke. 
That's the most sincere thing you've said today. William scowled, then covered his face with a hand once more. He was hopeless, and now they both knew it. Oh, the rapture. Come on now, Susan said. He could hear her standing and the rustle of her skirt as she moved closer to him. She tugged on his arm, trying to pull the hand away from his face. He let her, but only because the feel of her hands on him sent his stomach tingling in anticipation and his heart leaping for idiotic joy. For all that, it wasn't enough to wipe the scowl off his face, however. Susan smiled at him. Don't worry so. You'll figure out the right thing to say when the time comes. That's the magic of love. Oh, heavens, if I need magic to save me from myself, I'm truly doomed. Stop it, Susan said with a little stamp of her foot. Stop what? Telling the truth? Stop being so down on yourself. He twisted his hand about a little, catching her fingers in his own. Holding her hand felt so natural, a normal extension of the close friendship they'd shared for years. Did she feel the same, though? William ran his thumb over the back of her knuckles, watching her closely. We should probably skip straight to lesson number ten. I'm pretty sure I'll be better at that. His tone was back to teasing, he knew. But what else was he to do? A man had to work with what he had. Teasing Susan was all he knew. He got the reaction he expected, and dreaded. It was a shame that what a man had to work with was often exactly what was standing in his way. Susan tugged her hand away from his, casting her gaze heavenward. I said that would be lesson number ten, at the earliest. Governess, Susan was back. For now, you must learn how to comport yourself with dignity and refinement. That was guaranteed to be another lesson where he came up short. William shut his eyes. The whole point of this was to spend time with Susan, which he was accomplishing. More still, these lessons were no doubt good for him. Very well, he said, not bothering to open his eyes and look at Susan while speaking to her. Accompany me to the musicale tonight, and you can instruct me on the ways of being dignified and refined there. Excellent idea. William's heart leapt at her eager acceptance. He willed the unruly organ to calm. He would need his wits about him if he were to undo all the damage he'd done that afternoon over tea. Chapter 5 Susan spent no more time getting herself ready for the musicale that evening than she would have before her conversation with William that afternoon. She refused to spend extra time primping before the mirror simply to avoid seeing him again. But the moment she came down the stairs and saw him standing there, looking heart-stutteringly handsome, she grew angry all over again. William offered her his arm and she took it. They moved wordlessly toward the carriage, and after Fletcher helped Lady Blackmore in, William helped Susan up as well. The ride over was filled with insignificant chatter. Who would be in attendance tonight? Were she and Lady Blackmore too warm? Was Susan ready to perform the prelude she'd chosen? Who else might they expect to hear from tonight? Susan answered politely, but she didn't particularly care to look William in the eye. Despite him being all that was polite and attentive during the musical, Susan couldn't get past that afternoon. They'd been teasing one another, joking about his inability to sound sincere. Perhaps it was just her. Perhaps it was simply because of all the insincere statements they'd shared in the past. But every word out of his mouth had sounded markedly pretentious. Then he'd taken her hand. Her entire frame had heated. Her stomach had tilted and her heart had pounded erratically. A yearning, as powerful as it was undeniable, had filled her. Then he'd opened his insipid mouth and uttered those nonsensical words. Exactly what he'd said, she couldn't fully recall, but it didn't matter. What did matter was that it had become painfully clear that he was still teasing her. That the heat she felt flowing from their fingertips was all only on her side. The lady at the pianoforte came to the close of her song, bowed and took her seat once more. Susan joined with the audience in polite applause, two more performances, and then it would be her turn. Normally she grew quite nervous before performing. She was no virtuoso, but she was confident in her simple song. 
Still, standing up before so many people inevitably made her hands shake at least a little. But tonight she could hardly hear a single note or spare a passing glance for the audience who would soon be watching her. All her thoughts were on William. What was he doing to her? She'd certainly not asked to feel this way, but there was something, now and then, in the way he looked at her, in the way his hand found hers, that sent her heart racing and made her wonder. More applause, good gracious, the next performance was already over. Susan couldn't even recall if the lady had played or sung. Certainly her own mother never would have allowed herself to become so overwrought because of something so insignificant. William caught her eye and though he smiled, his brow dropped in question. He seemed to be asking if she was all right. Susan looked away without giving him the satisfaction of an answer. She hadn't been herself tonight, and no doubt every member of their party was aware something was wrong. But she couldn't help it. Some emotions were simply too big to be contained behind a polite smile. It was William's fault, moreover. If he didn't like how she was acting tonight, he had only himself to blame. It wasn't as though developing feelings for William would be so horrible. He was a good man. What made her angry was that he almost acted as though he were purposely stirring up such feelings in her for the sole purpose of laughing at her expense. With William, everything was a joke, at least as far as she was concerned. In the past, it hadn't bothered her. Their entire relationship had been built on jokes and pranks. How could she ever trust a man who was never sincere? Applause broke out around her yet again and it was her turn to perform. Susan stood and slipped between the rows of chairs and made her way to the pianoforte. Having her family and close friends know she was upset was one thing, but she didn't have any desire for the entire gathered party to know. It wasn't going to be easy, but she would just have to find a way to hide her anger even during her performance. William could hear Susan's anger in every note of her performance. He wished he knew exactly where he'd gone wrong. They'd had a good time that afternoon, or so he'd thought, even if she had turned into Governor Susan for the last bit. Still, when they'd parted ways to get ready for tonight, she hadn't been so upset. Now, though, clearly she was mad at him. Had something happened between their parting of ways that afternoon and tonight? If so, what? Had her maid done something? It made no sense. Mother was beginning to shoot him glances too, though he could read those no better than he could Susan's cold shoulder. Still, with the glances Mother was also giving Susan, he guessed she didn't know exactly what was happening between them, only that something was. That was about all he knew too. Susan continued to all but ignore him after her performance, no matter the kind compliment he gave her, during the rest of the performances, and even after they all stood and began visiting with the neighbours. Her refusal to look him in the eye was wearing on William. Wasn't this exactly what he was trying to avoid by agreeing to these stupid lessons? All he wanted was for her to be happy, preferably happy with him. Maybe this was a horrid idea to begin with. The idea of a man falling for the woman he teased every year growing up. It was ridiculous, doomed from the beginning. Would you care for a drink? He asked her suddenly, not caring that he was breaking into her conversation with Miss Windown. He needed a break from her company, and this was the only way he could manage it. Yes, thank you, Susan said slowly, clearly surprised by his abrupt interruption. And you, Miss Windown? Thank you, yes. He gave them both a brief bow and left their sides. It was like breathing freely for the first time all night. Was that not proof he and Susan would never be good together? William reached the table, holding a variety of refreshments. No doubt neither lady would mind if he took his time and got a drink for himself first. The watered-down port was a disappointment and did nothing to lift his spirits. Perhaps he should give up on this idea, say goodbye to Susan at the end of August and bury any feeling or notion that they would ever be more than friends. A sadness filled him at the thought. He turned, placing his back toward the refreshment table, and looked over to where Susan still spoke with Miss Windown. But oh, how desperately he wanted them to be more. He wanted her by his side, not just in August, 
but every month of the year. He wanted to not just offer her his arm, but to offer her his whole heart. William picked up a couple of glasses of lemonade and started back through the crowd. As ridiculous as the lessons were, he couldn't deny that he enjoyed them. He was quickly realising what he should have known all along. Any activity was better when Susan was there. It didn't matter if they were taking tea, strolling through the garden, riding horses, or dancing. If he was with Susan, he was doing what he wanted to be doing. He reached the spot where he'd left Susan and Miss Windown, only they weren't there now. William slowly turned, taking in the faces around him. Miss Windown was a few steps away, but she was with her mother now and Susan wasn't to be seen. William turned the other direction and caught sight of her, hand resting atop Lord Thompson's arm as they slowly walked toward a secluded corner of the room, their backs to him. William's stomach clenched. He turned his steps their direction all the same. He'd said he would get Susan some lemonade and that was what he intended to do, and if it meant rudely interrupting her moment with another gentleman, that wasn't his fault. Despite his better judgment, William couldn't help but wish Lord Thompson was a scoundrel. Then, at least, he could warn Susan away from him. If he were a gambler or womanizer, then Susan would have nothing to do with him. As it was, though, Lord Thompson was quite respectable. He could have probably passed that stupid lesson on sounding sincere without even trying. He would have passed and had Susan gazing up at him with loving eyes, and they would have been engaged by dinner. William pushed past a couple who tried to block his path with a huff. A trail of lemonade slipped over the edge of the cup and spilled over his gloved fingers. He needed to calm down. William slowed his step and took a breath. It wasn't Lord Thompson he was truly upset at. He was upset at himself, at his own failure. Then it's not me you're angry at? Lord Thompson asked Susan. That's a relief. William held his breath. Eavesdropping was certainly not what a refined gentleman would do, but Susan apparently didn't lump him in with that lot anyways. Moreover, at this point, he was getting desperate. No, I'm not angry at you, Susan said. But you are angry at someone. Without question. She was angry at him. It's Lord Blackmore. Exactly as he'd predicted. Do you care to tell me about it? Lord Thompson continued. He said something this afternoon that irked me. William both did and didn't want Susan to elaborate. He wished she would, so that he could know what he'd done that was so awful. He wished she wouldn't, because suddenly, Lord Thompson was the last person William wanted to have learned of his miserable inadequacies. Was he impolite? Lord Thompson's firm tone did him credit. Clearly he cared if someone mistreated Susan. If it were under different circumstances, William probably would have liked the man more for it. No, well, yes, but not intentionally. Susan lifted a glass of lemonade to her lips and took a small sip. William felt the weight of the two glasses in his own hands. Apparently, Lord Thompson had beat him to it all. He'd beat William to offering Susan lemonade, to offering her his arm for a turn about the room. He'd beat William to gaining Susan's confidence. Had he also beat William in securing Susan's affections? Lord Thompson pulled Susan a little to the right, and they walked on. William, however, remained rooted to the spot. Common sense probably would encourage him to give up at this point. A refined gentleman would probably bow to the better man and have done. Good thing, then, as Susan was quick to point out, he was no refined gentleman. William downed first one lemonade and then the other in quick succession. If tonight had taught him anything, it was that, come the end of August, he couldn't allow Susan to walk back out of his life, not without knowing exactly how he felt about her, which meant he needed to do something. If only he knew what in the blazes that something was. Chapter 6 Susan smoothed her skirt as a maid placed the tea service on the low table in front of her. Thank you, Susan said softly. The maid curtsied and left the parlour, leaving Susan alone in it. William would be here soon. They hadn't exactly said they would be having another lesson today, but she believed he'd come all the same. Her anger had finally burned itself out last night. Now, she simply felt foolish over the whole ordeal. Susan poured herself a cup of tea, 
If it were any other person coming to meet her, she would have waited for them before serving herself. But it was only William. William, who now stirred her heart as well as her mind whenever he was around. William, whose familiar smile and wit were becoming more and more important to her happiness. William, who had told her most clearly and not that long ago that he was taken with someone else. William, who was nothing at all like the man she'd always dreamed of forming a connection with, who was nothing at all like her beloved father. Susan sipped her tea, and there was the reason for her embarrassment. She'd allowed herself to become upset, all the while knowing William was wishing to pursue someone else, all the while knowing he wasn't the man she sought, of all the nonsensical things a lady could do. Let me guess, William said, walking through the door. Today is lesson number eight. How to beg forgiveness when you've made her angry. Susan scowled up at him, firmly ignoring the way her heart flipped at the sound of his voice. That sounds timely. But, may I add, you shouldn't start with a joke. His smile fell away. I am sorry, both for starting with a joke and for whatever I did wrong yesterday. Susan nodded her acceptance. It has already been forgotten. It was a lie, but she was certainly trying to forget. She'd far rather keep William as a friend than lose him as a potential suitor. Now come and sit. I believe today's lesson should be how to properly compliment her. William sat beside her on the settee closer than he usually did and their legs brushed. At the light touch, a prickle of desire spread through her. Susan coughed and turned away, picking up her tea once more. This lesson sounds easy enough, he said lightly, not at all in a tone that reminded her of her father. No doubt whomever William had set his sights on would appreciate his candour. She, on the other hand, preferred a gentleman of sophistication. Susan kept her gaze on the brown liquid swirling about her cup. You might be surprised. Most gentlemen of my acquaintance are quite poor at giving compliments. William rested his elbows on his knees and leaned forward. How can you bungle something so simple? He seemed to be trying to catch her eye. Susan gave him a quick glance. Her heart stammered at the sight of him, his firm jaw and his dark blue eyes, and she looked away once more. A gentleman of sophistication, a gentleman of sophistication. If you think it's simple, she said, her words a bit clipped, then I'm certain you'll need this lesson. Actually, teacher, William said, placing a hand gently atop her arm, I believe I would be better served learning how to apologise. Susan heated at his touch. She willed herself to stay steady, but her teacup clinked against the saucer regardless. I felt your apology just now was adequate. Susan quickly placed her tea back on the table. Besides, if you do all I've taught you so far, you won't have need to apologise. She turned to face him fully, ready to insist they put yesterday behind them and move on to the new lesson for the morning. But the moment her gaze met his, she knew it had been a mistake. He seemed to search her eyes, looking for the truth, but she wouldn't tell him. He cared for someone else. Susan, he said in a low voice, tell me what I did wrong. She opened her mouth to respond, but then reason shut it for her, with a resounding thud that echoed about her entire head. Susan pushed up off the settee and strode over to the large windows. Her pulsing heart was suddenly insisting she tell him, but if she ever spoke the words, certainly she'd regret it. William came up wordless behind her. She couldn't break the stillness, though. Her head spun too much. He wasn't at all like the man she'd always envisioned herself marrying. How could she even consider him as more than a friend? She wouldn't make him happy. He wouldn't make her happy. Then why was her arm still tingling where he'd rested his hand on her? Was it something I said? He asked at length. Susan shook her head. Another lie, but she didn't care. Was it something I didn't say? Another shake of the head. Was it something I did, or didn't do? She couldn't keep this up. 
she spun around, putting up her fiercest scowl as a shield. Who is she? The woman who's caught your eye? William rocked back slightly, his eyes growing a touch wider. Susan crossed her arms. I want to know her name. If she knew the woman's name, it would be far harder to imagine she didn't exist. It would be far easier to walk away, to stay just friends. William ran a hand through his hair, which did not set her heart fluttering. I don't think you're ready for me to tell you, he said slowly. What did that even mean? There is a woman, I understand? Yes, most assuredly. Then who is she? William shook his head firmly. Susan's brow dropped yet lower still. Is she someone I dislike? She'd met a surprisingly many petty and selfish young ladies during her season. Quite a few, in fact, who she was certain would make William more miserable than she herself would. Would it be easier or harder if he declared himself in love with someone she disliked? If the lady was vain, Susan could use that as an excuse to see less and less of William. But wouldn't it be easier to give him up if it meant giving him over to someone whom she trusted would be good for him? At the thought of losing these moments together, of never again sharing breakfast or going for a ride, an intense and nearly overwhelming sadness filled her. Ruination. The emotions were coming in constant waves, beating against her from every side. Part of her wished William would hurry up and get engaged to whomever his heart was set on just so this, whatever she was feeling, would end already. She'd felt certain her anger had been used up and was gone, and yet it too seemed to be making its way back into the various raging emotions she couldn't shake. William moved up close to her, and though Susan was fully aware that she ought to step back, she couldn't. He cupped her face in both hands, lifting her gaze to his. His face looked a little blurry, and when Susan blinked, a hot tear escaped. He brushed it away with a thumb. Please tell me what's wrong. She could only manage a whisper. You have to answer my question first. I did. My answer is, I don't think you're ready to hear. Her hands tightened into fists and she beat lightly against his chest. I'm not a little girl anymore, William. He brushed a bit of loose hair out of her face. I haven't seen you as a little girl in many years. Her heart sped up. William rested his forehead against hers. But what will I do if I tell you and you disagree? His nearness was intoxicating. The very air she breathed seemed filled with him, seemed to pull her in closer. William's voice was almost too quiet to hear. I don't want to lose you. We'll always be friends. The words shook for the lack of confidence. No. William spoke the truth she had been hoping they could always avoid. We're grown now, and we can't continue on as we are. He was right. She'd known it deep inside, but hadn't wanted to face it. Why not? She asked, even knowing the answer. Either, he said, pulling back and twirling a curl of her hair around a finger. You marry some idiot popinjay, in which case he will never allow me to hold you like this ever again. Or, William leaned in, bringing his mouth close to her ear. You marry me instead. A chill ran down her. Had he truly just said what she thought she'd heard? His breath against her neck was making it hard to think. His hands were on her back, pulling her close, gently rubbing away the barrier she'd been working so hard to construct. She closed her eyes. Was the sigh she heard hers? Marry me, dearest. Susan stiffened. Was he serious? Surely he couldn't be. They would murder one another within a year. He must have felt the change in her, for he pulled back slightly, tipping his head so that he might catch hold of her gaze. Susan. There was a slight edge of hesitation in his tone. Marry you? She could barely utter the words, let alone get her mind to wrap fully around them. His hands moved down her arms until he held hers. Come now, 
the idea isn't so repugnant, is it? When she thought about it, rationally and clearly, yes, it most certainly was. She couldn't imagine what he found in her to desire. He certainly wasn't the type of man she'd always planned to marry. But when she looked up at him, peered into his eyes and focused on the feel of her hands in his. Well, then it was a whole different story. I don't know, she finally whispered. William opened his mouth but was interrupted by a door somewhere nearby slamming with a bang. Blackmore, Fletcher's urgent cry met them a moment before the parlour door flung open. Susan pulled her hands free and stepped away. Her brother, however, seemed to barely recognise that she was even there. His shirt was untucked, and there was a frantic wildness to his eyes. Something was seriously wrong. It's Forrester, Fletcher spoke quickly. He got out last night, ate heaven knows what. The groom found him this morning several fields over, and at first everything seemed fine. But now he's lying down, and I can't get him to stand back up. Susan had never developed the ardent passion for horses that Fletcher had, but even she knew that a horse who wouldn't stand up would soon die. We've got some apples, William offered. Would he stand for a treat? Or maybe... <sighs> Fletcher shook the offer away. I've tried that. I've tried everything. Susan felt new tears forming behind her eyes. These weren't the angry, confused tears of before. These were pure sadness. Forrester was Fletcher's everything. When their parents had died, her brother had turned to horses for comfort, for connection, and for healing. To lose his beloved mount, she glanced over at William. It would be like her losing her best friend. We'll come out to the stable with you, Susan said, moving up to stand beside her brother. If nothing could be done, then they'd stay by him until the end. Fletcher nodded, already seeming to calm somewhat, then turned and hurried back out the door. Susan fell into step behind him. It was still summer, and plenty warm during the day, but the month was coming to a close, and that meant the nights could carry a light brush of chill. I'll grab a couple of blankets, she said to William over her shoulder, and meet you both out there. Before she could turn left out of the parlour to head upstairs, he took her hand. Just think on what I said, please. Susan paused, then nodded. She would think on it though she honestly had no idea what her answer would be. Either way, for now, their brother and best friend needed them. She would figure out her relationship with William afterward. Chapter 7 I'm sorry, my lord, the groom said, but there isn't anything else to try. Either he stands or he doesn't. It's up to the horse now. William nodded. It wasn't as though he'd disbelieved Fletcher when the man had said they'd tried everything. It had been hope that had driven William to question the groom himself. The groom took his leave to see to other duties, while also staying nearby in case Forrester turned worse. William turned slowly, taking in the sight of the grand steed, lying atop the hay, Fletcher near his head, and Susan rubbing his neck. Life, however, seemed bent on reminding him that hope alone did not mean there would be a favourable outcome. There was the rustle of soft footfalls against the stable floor, and William turned to find his mother slipping up beside him. Poor thing, she said softly. Are you referring to the horse or the man? William asked. Though the brother and sister were within clear view, they were far enough away that William's conversation with his mother was easily kept private. Mother slipped her arm through his, resting her head against his shoulder. Both, I imagine. William agreed. I don't know what Fletcher will do if he loses Forrester. Mother gave his arm a gentle squeeze. He'll still have his best friend. And of course, he'll always have Susan. William nodded once more, watching as the woman in question adjusted the blanket resting over Forrester, then gave her brother's hand a reassuring squeeze before going back to stroking the horse's neck. He hadn't exactly meant to propose earlier that night, only she'd been in his arms, and the truth that she would either marry him or someone else, had been all too pressing.
The words had tumbled out, rather unceremoniously at that. You have seemed more yourself as of late, Mother said, breaking through his errant thoughts. Had he? He hadn't really given his blue devilment much thought since that night he and Susan had danced. Now, as he thought back, however, he couldn't recall it being an issue since that moment either. I suppose I finally learned the truth behind my frustration. Mother pulled back. Though she didn't release her hold on him, she turned, and while William kept his gaze on Susan and Fletcher, he could feel her studying him. Have you? William nodded. He'd been frustrated at seeing Susan entertain the suits of other men. It sounded a bit petty now that he spelled it out in his mind, and the immaturity hadn't even ended there. All the while he'd been ignorant to what he was feeling, as though part of him refused to recognise the truth and instead buried it deeper and deeper inside of him, only aggravating the unsettling despondency until it nearly overwhelmed him. Until he had no choice but to acknowledge the true cause. Oh, thank heavens, his mother said with an impatient sigh. He whirled toward her. Excuse me? I love you dearly, William, but even I was starting to wonder just how dense you could be. William found himself laughing, though he wasn't exactly sure why. You knew? She gave him a flat stare. Of course I knew. I've known since before you and Fletcher left for university. I've known since before you were old enough to shave. William let that sink in. Even he hadn't realised his own feelings had begun so long ago. Mother shook her head. You should have seen the way you would light up every summer. Of course I did. School was out and Fletcher was coming to stay for a month. Mother gave him a particular look, one he wasn't sure how to read. The type of smile you wore each August. That was not a smile put there by a best mate. Gads, if only he'd been as aware of himself as his mother had been, he might have saved himself years of bumbling around in the dark. Mother continued, Well then, what do you plan to do now? William shrugged. That was the ultimate question. Does she know you care for her particularly? She does, now, for better or for worse. I may have proposed this evening. Mother's gasp of utter shock contained enough laughter in it that William wasn't sure if she was happy at what he'd done or giggling at his folly. When the light laughter continued, he eventually asked, You feel that was unwise of me then? Oh, I'm happy you finally figured out your heart but I'm not sure Susan has figured out hers yet. Then he had been wrong to propose. What if his words from that evening ruined it all? Suppose he scared her away and lost her forever. Honestly, Mother spoke on, her tone not nearly serious enough for his taste. I have often struggled to discern if she enjoys her time with you, merely tolerates your company surprisingly well, or simply finds profound pleasure in beating you at your own little teasing game. Thank you for your confidence in me. Oh, my beautiful boy. She leaned against him once more. I wish I could promise you an easy resolution. You make it sound hopeless. Watching Susan continue to administer to Forrester, William could think of no one more beautiful, no one he admired and respected more. I wouldn't say hopeless. But Mother's tone wasn't confident either. The problem is you're not what she's looking for. Ah, yes. Susan wants someone refined and poised. He truly tried to keep the derision out of his voice, but failed miserably. About as miserably as he was failing with Susan. Susan was so young when she lost her parents. I think in many ways, deep down, she's still that little girl waiting for them to come home. No, it's more than that. She's wanting to become them. She wants to be her elegant mother, and she wants to marry a man who fits the few memories she has of her poised father. I think you're right. The blue devilment was back. It clung to him, a weight that spoke of losing the woman he loved, of never being enough to claim her heart. The problem, he said, is that she knows me too well. She's known me too long. I could never be a poised gentleman in her mind. No, Mother shook her head. You two know each other far too well to ever be anything other than Susan and William. Then she'll never have me. Perhaps he would take a trip to the continent. He had no desire to be in England when some man finally did match the ideal Susan had set up in her own mind. Mother moved and stood directly in front of him. She was a tall woman, 
and yet he could still easily see Fletcher and Susan over the top of her head. But with the expression she held on her face, he didn't dare look at anyone but her. I said you're not what she's looking for. Mother's words were low and firm. I never said you two weren't perfect for one another. William threw his hands out to either side, even as hope once more burst to life in his chest. It had the unfortunate effect of colliding with his discouragement, and the two inharmonious emotions left him with a sharp pain radiating throughout his whole being. I don't understand your meaning. That poised man Susan has worked up inside her head is all wrong for her. That's why I first suggested you take a grand tour. I was hoping that prolonged time away from each other might help you both realise you'd been looking in the wrong places for happiness. I felt Susan meeting and associating with other gentlemen would be the easiest way for her to see what has been right in front of her this whole time. Then maybe I should still leave. If that's what it took to get Susan to come around, he wouldn't be opposed, though the thought of leaving her did not settle well on his stomach. What? After you just proposed? I raised you to be a better gentleman than that. William couldn't deny the relief he felt. So, I help her see that she doesn't need a poised gentleman, that we truly would be good together. Unfortunately, Mother shook her head. Only she can decide if she's ready to let that ideal go or not. For now, all you can do is let her know how deeply you care. He did care, most ardently. Susan was his everything. Without her, he'd only ever have half a life. Will it be enough? He softly spoke the question that beat repeatedly against his mind. Mother turned, and once more they faced the brother and sister together. When she finally answered, her words came out as a whisper. Honestly, I don't know. Chapter 8 Exhausted but relieved, Susan trudged her way up to her bedchamber. After staying up nearly the entire night with him, Forrester had finally stood half an hour ago. Fletcher was still with Forrester and would no doubt stay with him for the rest of the day. But, once they'd known the horse would make it and all was well again, Susan had excused herself. She desperately needed some sleep, if sleep was even possible after what William had asked her earlier. She'd done her best to ignore his question while in the stables. After all, Fletcher had needed her. But now, alone in her bedchamber, she could think of nothing else. Susan lowered herself into a chair near the hearth. A small fire burned orange and red behind the grate. She ought to undress and climb into bed, but she couldn't pull her gaze away from the short flames as they licked the brick surrounding them. What was she going to tell William? His proposal had come as such a complete shock. She was still wrapping her mind around it. Could she marry William? An excitement surged up inside her at the idea and yet she still hesitated. It was an arrangement she had never planned to rush into headlong, not with any man. She wasn't sure what she had expected a proposal to feel like, but she certainly had expected more of a warning before receiving one. William was not at all like the man she'd always thought she'd marry. He wasn't the refined, perfectly polished paragon of her dreams. He didn't remind her of father in the least. The window frame across the room rattled. Susan's head snapped up. The window opened with a whine and the curtains fluttered. Susan? William's deep voice broke through the dark room at the same time his head appeared between the break in the curtains. What in heaven's name was he doing here? Susan stood and slipped into the shadow of the nearest corner. Whatever his purpose in sneaking into her room through the window, she wasn't ready to face him just yet. Especially not in her own bedchamber, alone. Heat rushed through her. William looked about him but clearly didn't see her. He slipped first one leg and then the second over the windowsill. Walking quickly and quietly, he moved over to her bed, which had yet to be turned down. With his back to her, Susan moved over to the window and peered out. He'd slipped into her room many times before, leaving snakes in her bed or ink in her hair, or both, and she'd often wondered if he'd come in through a servant's door or some other way. Now she supposed she had her answer. Susan turned back toward William in time to see him pull a letter out of his jacket pocket. 
and place it atop her pillow. At least it's not snakes, she said. William whipped around, eyes wide, a yelp escaping him. Susan laughed at his fright. William shook his head, sitting down heavily atop her bed. Gad, Susan. He ran a hand down his face. Serves you right for sneaking in here. When he pulled his hand away from his face, he was smiling. Muttering something under his breath, William stood and snatched the letter from her pillow. He stalked over to her and held it out. Here, he said without preamble. Read this. He hardly waited for her to take the letter before letting go of it and moving past her and back toward the window. She was suddenly reluctant for him to go. What is it? Susan asked. Just read it, William said, one leg already over the ledge. Can you not give me a hint? She moved up beside him. William gave her a quick glance, then lowered himself out the window and onto the bit of roof that jutted out from the wall. I think not. With that, he disappeared below the window. Susan leaned out and watched as he walked down the steep slope of the roof, climbed from there onto a stretch of fence and hopped off onto the ground. He stuck his hands into his pockets as he strode away, never once looking back at her. In the distance, the first traces of pink lined the horizon. The letter in her hand suddenly felt heavy. He had been right before. Either she continued to search for the ideal paragon, the perfect gentleman as she defined him in her mind, or she stopped. Instead, she could just keep swapping tricks with William, here at Blackmore Hall. It sounded rather childish and immature. And yet, the alternative meant forever giving up her best friend. Susan's gaze flitted to the small box on her bedside table, the one that held Mother's pearls inside. What would her parents think if she accepted William's offer? All they had ever wanted for her when she'd been a little girl was for her to be happy. Would it not be the same now? Then, if she set aside any preconceived judgments regarding what it meant to be a grown woman, and what kind of a person that meant she should be or marry, what would make her happy? In that moment, when the first yellow rays of sunlight broke over the treetops, Susan had her answer. With a smile on her face, she sat atop the windowsill and swung her legs over the ledge. Making it onto the roof was not difficult, but the slope proved more precarious than she'd originally assumed. She used both hands and had to take small steps to keep from tumbling down. Getting from the roof to the fence was even harder, especially considering she was in a skirt but with William barely more than a thumb-sized form in the distance, it wasn't as though anyone was around to see her ankles when they peeked out. Finally on the ground, Susan broke into a run. She called to William once she drew near. He turned, uncertainty clear in his expression. Susan held out the letter to him. How about you read it to me? He looked from the letter to her, you do realise that when a person sneaks into your room to leave you something, it's generally because they don't want to be around when you read it. Then you shouldn't have gotten caught. William pressed his lips tight, as though fighting off a smile. I thought you'd still be with Fletcher and Forrester. Gathering what courage she had, Susan took a few steps closer. I was too tired to keep my eyes open. His brow lifted and he leaned toward her, but not too tired to climb out a window. The gauntlet had been thrown. I see. Then his smile faltered. I suppose that wasn't particularly refined of me to climb in through a lady's window. Perhaps another lesson is in order. She hoped to see him smile again, but when he didn't, Susan felt her own slip away as well. Why say you were taken with someone? I'm not taken with just anyone, William said, lifting a hand to her face and brushing a stray curl back. I'm in love, Susan, and the woman of my affections is you. Her breath caught, both at his words and at the gentle brush of his fingertips against her cheek. And the lessons? I was looking for an excuse to spend time with you. 
Perhaps I was hoping the right time to tell you the truth would present itself along the way. Susan placed her hands against his chest, the letter crinkling in the process. Why not just say so from the beginning? I was afraid if I said anything it would come out all wrong and I'd lose you for good. His arms went around her waist. But now I'm more worried that my silence would be worse than any bungled attempt. Then tell me, Susan whispered. But, instead of using words, William lowered his lips to hers. The kiss was soft, giving her plenty of space to pull back if she wished it. Instead, Susan took hold of his jacket in her hands and kissed him back with all that was in her. For years they had joked and teased, been friends and enemies. Now, though, they were also more. They were each other's futures, each other's everything. It was several minutes before they pulled back, both breathing heavily. William took to trailing kisses across her forehead and then down near her ear. Is that the answer to my question, then? Question? Susan asked, revelling in the way her skin tingled all over. He reached her neck and didn't stop. I believe I asked you to marry me. She groaned with pleasure. William chuckled and lifted his head, their noses lightly brushing. Is that a yes? I suppose so, Susan said, but only because you mastered lesson number ten so well. William laughed out loud, giving her another quick kiss. I told you I would be good at that one. I don't know. Perhaps we ought to have you practice a bit more. It was several minutes before the kiss that ensued came to an end. What was it about sunrises that made kisses so sweet? Or perhaps it was just the man she was sharing them with. As Susan leaned away once more, the letter crinkled in her hand. She'd completely forgotten she was still holding it. Oh dear. She smoothed it against William's chest. I'm afraid your letter is terribly wrinkled now. He took it from her hand. That's all right. It isn't really necessary anymore. What did it say? Taking her hand, they turned back towards the house. Nothing I haven't said to you already this morning. Then perhaps I ought to read it because I really enjoyed what you told me this morning. Perhaps? He pulled her close and kissed her forehead. But it really is more fun telling you in person. Susan giggled. Then I shall keep it for some day when you aren't able to tell me in person. William pulled them to a stop. I anticipate it getting quite covered in dust then, for I don't plan on not telling you in person any time soon. And he kissed her again. Epilogue Blackmore Hall, 19 months later Susan angled her needle point closer toward the low burning candle. She was so close to being done. It was late and her eyes ached, but she didn't want to lie back down until she was finished. The baby inside her pressed against the underside of her ribs. Susan placed the needle point down and pressed back with a gentle hand. I know the doctor said to rest, but I'm nearly done. The baby shifted about, this time pressing against her side. Susan laid her hand down over the spot. Was it just her imagination? Or could she actually feel the outline of a foot? She smiled and soaked in the joy of the moment. Slowly she shut her eyes, resting her head back against the settee. If this little bundle of hers didn't stop tossing and turning all the time, he or she was liable to toss their way into an early delivery. The doctor had said everything looked good, but there were moments when Susan felt certain this baby would make their appearance sooner than expected. Perhaps she ought to rest just to be on the safe side. After all, she could always work on the blanket she was embroidering some more tomorrow. Just as her shoulders began to fully release and sag into the comfort of the settee, the parlour door opened. In walked William, his hair sticking out in strange directions. Susan took one look at him and burst into laughter, which hurt slightly, as she had no belly space with which to truly laugh. So, William spoke between her giggles, his voice calm as ever. Strange thing happened while I was readying myself for dinner. Susan's laughter wouldn't stop. Oh, 
did it now? Yes. He lightly touched his porcupine hair, proving it was stiff as a board. It appears someone has mixed glue in with my pomade. How very odd, Susan said, trying to control herself once more. Isn't it just, though? William placed his elbows on the back of the settee and leaned over, bringing his face closer to hers. I can't help but think it's something exactly like what my wife might have done when we were younger, but I keep telling myself a pregnant woman soon to deliver couldn't possibly bother with something so unrefined as a prank. Susan rolled her lips inward, but good heavens, his hair spiked out in every direction, and it was so hard to keep from laughing out loud again. You're right, she said, to keep herself under control. I'm sure your wife has far better things to occupy her time. William stood up straight, then stepped over the low back of the settee, standing for a moment atop the cushion before sitting himself down beside her. Susan swatted at his legs as he did so. Don't put your dirty boots on my furniture. William sat and gave her an expression of mock surprise. Oh, so it's yours now? Never mind, I was the one who grew up here. I am the mistress of Blackmore Hall, Susan said, lifting her chin. So yes, it's all mine. William slipped a hand over the back of the settee just behind her and leaned in. And what about the master of Blackmore Hall? Susan looped a finger over the top of his cravat and pulled him in for a quick kiss. He's mine too. William gave her a quick kiss back. Just so long as we're clear on that point. Now we are. But it's rather a miracle we got here. For all the lessons you had on the subject, you were terrible at courting. It wasn't my fault. William said with a shrug. I had a horrible teacher. Excuse me, Susan said with a laugh as she slapped him playfully in the chest. William kissed her on the forehead and then stood. Care to dance? There's no music. Still, she let him pull her to her feet, an endeavour that took more and more effort every day, it seemed. No, but remember, it was while we were dancing that I first realised I loved you. Who would have ever guessed that a boy who routinely dumped buckets of water over the heads of his guests would ever grow into such a romantic man? It was probably the frogs. Susan laughed again, but before they could truly start dancing, William cupped her face in his hands. You know I love you more than anything, don't you? Yes, William, I do. He smiled and kissed her lightly. Then William took Susan's hand in his own and they began dancing. Bonus Epilogue May 1806. Lady Charlotte Blackmore allowed the curtain to fall back down over the carriage window. If only her driver would go faster. She'd far rather arrive before sunset, before her new grand baby was asleep for the night. Oh heavens, she could not wait to meet the little bundle of joy rather inconsiderate of the chap to arrive early before his grandmother had a chance to arrive and greet him properly. Ah, well, his father had arrived early too. She should have expected it and gone to Blackmore Hall before. The carriage pulled to an abrupt halt. Charlotte reached out with both hands to keep herself from tumbling head first into the bench across from her. With both hands spread out wide, she finally steadied herself, even as the carriage settled with a groan. What in goodness name could have happened? They hadn't tipped or fallen into a ditch. The carriage was still fully upright. A loud voice called from outside. Then a second. Neither was the voice of her driver or footman. The carriage door was flung open to reveal a burly man with a cloth tied about the lower half of his face and a hat pulled low over his eyes. Get out! he barked. Charlotte righted herself quickly and lifted her chin. Sir, you are addressing the Marchioness of Blackmore. You will treat me as such. Thank you for clarifying that bit. The burly man smirked even while lifting a gun and pointing it her direction. The click of the hammer was nearly deafening. Now, get out. Charlotte's jaw ground tight. 
though a trembling had begun in her stomach, she kept her composure. He may have a gun pointed at her, but Charlotte wasn't about to fall to pieces. She stepped down from the carriage and fluffed the skirt of her blue dress in an effort to look wholly unaffected. The reticule tied about her wrist bumbled against her legs at the effort. At the click of coins from inside, the burly man's eyes widened. Looks like we stopped the right carriage, lads. Two other men gave chuckled cheers. One stood near the horses, his gun aimed at Charlotte's driver and footman, who were both kneeling on the ground, hands behind their heads. The other man, also covering his face with cloth, sauntered over. The burly man addressed him. Check for baggage inside the carriage. I'll take the trunk tied to the back. Charlotte looked from one highwayman to the other. I forbid you to touch a single thing of mine. The burly man whirled toward her, his voice growing yet louder. I'll take anything I please. Despite her determination, Charlotte took a small step back. The burly man grabbed her arm, tugging her toward the back of the carriage, where he spun her around until she was facing the trunk tied up there. Open it, he yelled. Charlotte drew in a breath, steadying her nerves. Years of life, of being a mother, a widow, a member of the Hort Tun, had taught her much about remaining in control. If I refuse, she even placed her hands on her hips for good measure. The burly man sauntered over closer to her. Open the trunk, lady, or I'll shoot the key out of your reticule. Charlotte harumphed her displeasure, but deep down she was starting to truly worry. Charlotte tugged at the cords of her reticule, opening it and pulling out the key. These three men had them at gunpoint. More importantly, she hadn't spotted any horses nearby other than those driving her own carriage. Highwaymen who struck without horses did not often leave their victims alive. The burly man snatched the key from her and quickly opened the trunk. They're gifts for my new grandson, she said, stepping back as he soiled all she had so carefully packed. Fine gifts for a little brat, the burly man said with a mean laugh. They'll garner me a pretty bit of blunt too when I sell them. Charlotte couldn't stop the scowl that took over her expression. I worked hard making those. All those hours with her new grandbaby in mind. And now these men were going to ruin it all. Of course, it wouldn't truly matter if she never got to see her grandson, never got to hold him or kiss him. Charlotte blinked several times to keep the tears at bay. William and Susan would never forget how much she loved them, would they? If she never had the chance to say goodbye, she prayed they would still know. A shot erupted through the air. Charlotte froze, every muscle instantly going tense. The man standing over her driver and footman cried out and crumpled. The burly man started but didn't go so much as half a step before a second shot rang out and he too collapsed to the ground. A man, Charlotte had not seen where he'd come from, charged directly at her, his rifle at the ready. Down! Charlotte dropped to her knees, covering her head with both arms. She felt the air as the butt of his gun passed directly above her. It hit something with tremendous force, the crack echoing about her mind. The third highwayman dropped to the ground directly beside her. Charlotte blinked a few times, taking in the sudden change in her situation. Her driver was tying up the man who'd held a gun to his head only moments ago. Her footman hurried over, taking hold of the burly man. He glanced over at Charlotte and she nodded that she was all right. The third man didn't stir, clearly unconscious for the moment. Slowly, Charlotte stood. The man who'd saved her rested against the large carriage wheel. Pardon the interruption, my lady, he said, inclining his head. Pardon you? she said. I think I should rather be thanking you. Heavens. But it had all happened so fast. Only moments ago she'd been happily sitting in the carriage, thinking of only her new grandson and seeing family once more. Then, the man with the rifle continued, perhaps your gratitude will extend far enough to excuse my bluntness as well. He faced her fully. His was a handsome face, but not a familiar one. 
It is unwise for so fine a carriage to traverse these roads with only two men to protect it. I do usually wait to travel with my son, Charlotte said, the weight of what he'd just done for her quickly sinking in. Only he has a new baby, and his wife has been doing poorly since the birth. Her voice broke. Gracious, but she'd nearly been killed. I am on my way to visit them, to help if I can. She lifted a hand, finding a lock of hair which had come loose from beneath her bonnet. She tucked it back where it belonged. Her hand trembled against the side of her face. The man reached out to her, his tone softening. Come, you ought to sit. Sit. She may have almost been shot, but as it stood she was quite whole. I am the Dowager Marchioness of Blackmoor, and I do not cower before highwaymen, or anyone. The man seemed surprised by her title, and he gave her a low bow. Very well, my lady. May I be of any more assistance? Judging by the way he responded, and by his clothing, he was in trade. That would account for why their paths had never crossed before which was rather a pity as she would have remembered such a distinguished countenance. He looked about her age, too, with a bit of grey at the sides of his head and sharp eyes that clearly took in everything. I believe my men have it under control now, she said. Many thanks to you. Think nothing of it. He stood, and Charlotte couldn't help but admire his broad shoulders. If you will excuse me, my daughter is waiting for me he pointed back toward the trees to the side of the road. No doubt she is worried for my safety. Your daughter is with you. Charlotte suddenly didn't want him to leave. Of course, she'd meant it when she'd said her men had things under control now, but one did not often meet upstanding gentlemen who were willing to do what this man had just done for her. Certainly thanks were owed, and more than just those one could speak. Bring her here, I'd dearly like to meet her. The man hesitated. I think it's best we simply be on our way. Charlotte's hands returned to her hips. First he'd had the audacity to censure her for travelling this road alone. Now he wasn't even going to allow her to meet his daughter. You think I'm foolish? No, my lady. His voice was even but clearly life had taught him to keep his composure, just as it had taught her. I understand wishing to be with your family during their time of need. It is for that same reason I wish to be leaving. You see, I have two other daughters at home as well. No doubt an incident such as the one they'd just had would only make him wish to be home all the more. You wish to ascertain for yourself they are safe as well? It is as you say, my lady. He was a good father, the kind of father she believed her son would be. Very well, Charlotte said, pulling her shoulders back. I will have John see that you are paid for your services, and I will bid you a good day. Hopefully the money could help cover something for his daughters. She had a suspicion this man rarely splurged on anything for himself. No, the man put up his hand. I don't accept charity. This isn't charity. Charlotte refuted with equal strength. You rendered a service. I'm paying you for it. The man shook his head again. Charlotte pursed her lips. You must allow me to show my gratitude in some manner. It is clear you care for your family, the man said. Same as I care for mine. If you will only allow me to leave to do so now, I will consider that payment enough. He truly did care for his family. Charlotte's mind took hold of a thought, one that sent a thrill through her. It was a bit unorthodox, but she'd seen much good in this man, and in only a short span of time. He'd saved her life, at the risk of losing his own. He treated her with respect, while also holding his ground. His daughters were clearly the most important thing to him, and his actions showed it. Charlotte held his gaze. Your greatest desire is for your daughters and their well-being, correct? To see them happily situated and safely cared for. The man leaned back slightly at the intensity in her tone. 
At length, he nodded. Charlotte's smile grew. Then allow me to help with that. At the end, the romance continues in The Audacious Miss Eliza. This has been The Dauntless Lady Susan, a prequel to the Daughters of Courage series. Written by Laura Rollins, copyright 2023 by Laura Rollins. Production copyright by Laura Rollins. Learn more about the Daughters of Courage series and download a free short story at www.laurarollins.com.